Welcome to the Sourcing Hero podcast produced by Una, a group purchasing organization that empowers sourcing heroes and Art of Procurement, the world's largest procurement podcast network. I'm your host, Kelly Barner. The goal of the Sourcing Hero podcast is to capture the epic stories of people who are rising up and beating the odds to create exceptional value within procurement directly from those heroes themselves. Today, my guest here on the Sourcing Hero podcast is Kevin Frechette. Kevin is the co-founder and CEO of Fair Market. Now, one of the things Kevin focuses on in his conversations with procurement professionals and teams is how they think procurement can be transformed using data, automation, analytics, and of course, AI. So hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me on, Kelly. Now, I shared a little bit about what you do professionally today, but we know there's a lot of interesting and unique journeys that people took to get into procurement. So what should listeners know about your professional journey to this point? Um, I mean, the running joke of everyone that got into procurement kind of usually looks around and said, how did we get here? (laughs) I'm not there at all in that camp. Um, Had it completely, so um, was more on the, the finance and the enterprise sales side. Um, started a company with, with two awesome co-founders, Tark and Victor, now built out a great rest of the company and executive team. Um, but we, we were trying to solve a whole different problem when we first started, but we kind of uncovered this uh, underlying opportunity that came with the procurement space and the amount of data that was there, amount of transactions, amount of spend, um, and just kind of like how manual the processes were to even get to the outputs that we do today. So we, we pivoted the company about four or five months in, which for anyone that started a company knows that's not an, a... Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most fun and easiest decision to completely pivot on like why you quit your previous company. Um, and, but, uh, but we did it and we, we got immersed about five and a half years ago in the procurement space, started going to all the conferences, started to meet really, really, really cool people, both on the, um, the supplier side, the vendor side, and then on the practitioner side. So we, we kind of just kind of fell into it. And we, since the last five and a half years, uh, it's exhilarating once you're in it. And once you understand what the opportunity is, what the challenges are, but I get it from the outside, why people kind of view procurement a little differently, uh, but that's okay. We'll, 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 we know what's, what's under the hood and we're, we're fired up about it. <laughs> well, you're sort of going on simultaneous crazy journeys, right? Because the entrepreneurial journey is just bonkers, right? And then of all the years, you know, three of the last five that we've been talking about, we've seen not only unbelievable challenges in the world, but really the arrival of revolutionary new technology. And one of those is going to be the core of our conversation today. So I always love it when I know people are regularly having conversations with people on a topic and we get to pick their brains. So when we think about AI and all of the excitement that's garnered, a little fear too mixed in there, what would you say are some of the key themes that you're hearing from people as AI comes up in conversation? Well, I'd say AI is uh, a topic, obviously, in the technology been around for a super long time. I mean, we've started building AI into our platform three, four, five, like four and a half years ago. Um, so from that perspective, we are seeing it's getting more attention spotlight because generative AI uh, has made it actually possible. Yeah. In like ChatGPT, that was the big thing. You can actually interact with it and you can actually touch and feel it. And the cool thing about generative AI versus AI is it now produces um, unique outputs and creative outputs that once again, surprise people. When people can touch and feel it and they get surprised by it, they start to get intrigued or they start to feel other emotions. So I would say, um, although we've been in this camp and kind of pushing on this and putting a lot of time and resource into this with our customers the last four years, in the last four months, it, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like the movie Independence Day when all the uh, all the, the scientists are in that like bunker and then they're saying like how exciting it's been that like since the aliens came back, everything's been lighting up and going around. Obviously, then like I think uh, Will Smith level sets or someone does. <laughs> oh my God, all these bad things. But that's kind of what's happening right now, where it's because it's getting so much attention. You're now starting to see uh, everyone pivoting towards talking about AI. You're seeing um, CFOs, CEOs, and boards saying like, "What's our AI strategy?" Like, like it, it's viewed as like, "What's our plan?" Where if you even rewind it back four or five months, it was still hyper skeptical. There were still a lot of companies sending out emails saying we're not going to engage with generative AI, right. um, sending emails that we were getting from our customers saying that um, you can't include it in your products, like hard stop. 
And then two months ago, we started to get those same customers to say, okay, like, I know you brought up before, like, what is the plan? And then in the last 15 to 20 days, it's been, how do we make it part of our process? How do we get it in? Which is great because uh, you're seeing this massive shift, which should also tell you what the next six months is going to lead. Uh, but the challenge with that is because there's all this excitement, all this hype, it's definitely overhyped, but there is all this hype that now it's becoming almost like a checkbox for people as opposed to really digging in and saying, what's the right fit for us? And you can't just do that overnight if you're not educated in the space. So we can talk about it more later, but for everyone, for customers, for practitioners, for suppliers, for, for Gartner, for everyone, everyone's on this learning curve and this journey uh, that I think if you approach it in the right way, you can be methodical about it and you can, you can kind of take those necessary incremental steps. It's when people try to go from zero to hundred or they try to say, let's use Gen AI for all of procurement or all of XYZ. That's when you're, you're kind of left not feeling too great because it was kind of an over promise under deliver. Well, and it's funny because you mentioned the hype. I'm old enough to remember 10 minutes ago when blockchain was going to fix everything. Do you remember that week or month or, or whatever that was? I mean, you for a while couldn't attend a webinar and blockchain wasn't automatically the answer. And so it does seem fair while we're enthusiastic about the potential of AI and more specifically generative AI to say, wait a minute, you know, we've been down this road before. Why is this time different? Are you starting to get the sense, maybe based on the acceleration that you've talked about, that this time truly is going to be different? Absolutely. No, blockchain, blockchain had a unique, it kind of like pulled people in in a similar way where the crypto scene in 2017 got everyone really excited about yeah. it. Yeah. And then everyone started to hype up, okay, can we start using smart, smart contracts on the Ethereum network? Uh, like, can we have everything stored on Hyperledgers for, for security purposes? So like there was potential use cases there and there probably still are, but none of them had been realized in a business sense. What's very different about this is AI is not, not new and AI is already being used to solve business problems and it has for a long time. This is just the next iteration of AI. So when you think about, is it overhyped? Yes. Is there a ton of companies that are getting funding that maybe shouldn't because they haven't found product market fit or real kind of business value? Absolutely. But it's also a good thing because now that more funds getting poured into it, you do start to have these winners that come out that did find that right exact fit. And for us, specifically our stage, we're more of like that mid-sized company. Um, it's taking what we've already learned. It's taking the, the value we've already shown to our customers and saying, how do we accelerate that or enhance it or amplify it with generative AI? So that's where it kind of gets interesting because we don't have to do everything. We can do it in small chunks and start proving it over time and getting wins with customers that they can go back to their boards, their executive team and say, yep, this is how we use it. This is the output. Now let's go to the next one. So it, it does make it kind of like on the GPT side with people using OpenAI, it makes it a little more tangible or someone can point to the results they're getting from it, which once again, you couldn't do with blockchain because that was still more of the promise yeah. of the future versus the delivery today. Well, and I appreciated uh, sort of the shift that you'd shared talking about the letters where first you were getting the letters like, don't you put this in your product because InfoSec, our IT team, they will not approve us using it. And then I think, what was it, this six months later, it was like, please tell me that you disregarded our letter and that you actually have something to tell us that this is going to be in your platform because we want to know what you're doing. Um, you know, when we think about it from a product development standpoint, there's what goes into the product and then there's how you talk about what's in the product. Are you finding that it's effective to say right up front, you know, hey, here's what we're doing with whatever form of AI, or are you staying more focused around the user experience? And then if people ask, you know, is there AI in it, then you can kind of go into those details. What are you finding resonates most with the procurement community? I, I kind of go back to uh, talking about that journey. Yeah, uh, of course. Because th th that's, that's what seemed to resonate well, <clears throat> um, where... Typically the first step in the journey for everyone, for us included, is the education side. So it's just how do you, for us, it was to first do about a month of just internal like, like homework essentially, where we went out and we put together a SWAT team for Gen AI. We did as much research as we could, watch as many videos as we could, and like got really inspired. Uh, a lot of really cool um, like lessons learned and examples of even learning about the difference between like GPT-3, 3, 5, 4. Uh, and just like to give exact examples, like um, watching videos because there's not a ton of great content. So you kind of have to like, mm -hmm. like get a little scrappy, but there is examples of um, in previous versions, previous versions of GPT, uh, you'd ask GPT, I have four eggs, I have a pencil and a notebook. How do I stack them on top of each other? So it's kind of like, it's not a, a 
there's not that answer on the internet. So it's like, okay, you have to come up with it, which is part of generative AI, not just AI, which is trained algorithms. And in the older version, it would say, like, take the pencil, stick it up straight, put two eggs on top, put the notebook on top, and then put two eggs on top, which obviously anyone was going to know that's not possible because the pencil is going <laughs> to fall over. But then in the next iteration, even three or four months later, it would say, stack the two eggs next to each other, put the notebook on top, and then tuck the pencil into the notebook. So it starts to actually surprise you. And there's a bunch of examples like that of sometimes when it got better and other times actually when it got worse or when it got better. And then for security reasons, they pulled back some of the new releases. So it's just cool to be able to see that. Um, so we did about, I'd say like a month of like education. And then we pulled in about five or six customers. We asked like five or six and we said, do you want to go on this journey with us? We're looking to go down the Gen AI journey. We're not sure where we're going to get to, but we're going to learn and we're going to figure out like, is there a business case? So we did that. We kind of got different use cases. We internally said, let's let's try it out on low risk, like validation, like projects. So we did it for internal for help desk support. We did it for our customer documentation. So we indexed all of our documentation and then allowed customers to easily search and engage with our help desk. Um, and then we kind of finally found that business case with customers saying, okay, we identified the problem, the user experience. And then it became time to say, all right, now how do we start to actually insert um, generative AI to, to drive different outcomes than you would normally get from either just AI or just from traditional pr approaches when it comes to sourcing. So I'm not sure if you want to get into that or not, but it, it's kind of, by that time, we were two or three months in with a handful of customers and that group probably expanded to about 12. So now everyone was on the journey. They were talking to their CFOs about it. And it was just showing that there's a plan to get there, even though we weren't there yet. And right now our beta is live and we'll probably go GA in the next couple of months. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's not like a clear cut black and white. Sure. I, I will say you brought up security. That is 100% going to be a factor for all companies is making sure they have a clear stance on what their security policy is. And then the suppliers that they're going to work with their technology partners, um, what their stance is. Like for us, nothing that we do is going to train, uh, train external models. So everyone's going to have a different kind of like position, but it's important to have one because then that way you do have an answer. You do have at least like the roadmap of how are we going to make sure we're protecting ourselves as we try out this new tech. Well, and that certainly is a concern. And it's, it's funny because I can remember being in procurement and you wanted to have an update to your spend analysis solution. And so geez, at this point, I've even forgotten what it was. Some kind of disc, just roll with me on some kind of disc. Mm -hmm. They were shipped to the provider and then they would do whatever they had to do to upload that. And we had to go through sort of the evolution of saying like, no, it's, it's all going to happen in the cloud now. And IT had to adjust to that from a, a risk and security perspective. And now we're talking about not only allowing these systems to have access to data, but then also allowing them to think based on that data. I know you talked about having customers with you on the journey, but as you were figuring some of these out, did you have anyone or, or part of that group of people sort of representing the security point of view who knew when to pop up and say, okay, hold it, everybody. You've all gotten very excited about flying cars, comparably speaking. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about like takeoff and landing first? Because there are some very real concerns here. Uh, what's, what's the educational process that procurement needs to go on around those security issues? Yeah, um, great question, because we do have customers in very regulated industries that they can't go on the journey with us right now in terms of actually using it, but they can go on the journey when it comes to being part of the experience, being part of the learnings and the feedback sessions. Um, and because they know that at a certain time, like the, the, the barrier is going to be taken down and they're going to be able to use it. So they want to be ready for that. Um, we've also, so we, we've talked to uh, a lot of like the third party analysts in terms of understanding like like talking through like how should we be thinking about not only how like what we're doing internally, but how we position it. Um, we've also worked with a lot of our venture teams. We're fortunate to work with some really, really good investors um, in terms of the, the legal teams that they've put together to like, work with a lot of different portfolio companies, work with different CIO groups uh, and chief security information security officer groups to figure out like, OK, what do we need to show today? Uh, what needs to be our roadmap? How does that document it? So like, there, there needs to be a lot of thought that goes into it. I will say um, I, it does feel a lot like the journey to the cloud. I think that's a great example that you gave where people were terrified, even their own internal private clouds. So you had like your virtual environments through VMware, or Hyper-V, whatever that you use. And uh, people were terrified not to have it on a box or a disk. And then even in a private cloud environment with VMware, it was still also like actually within your data center. So from a security perspective, 
like very secure, but it was on the cloud, uh, which terrified people because it was new. And then you have the public cloud, which terrified people even more because you're putting it out there. <laughs> but then you start to actually look at the security of putting it out publicly versus keeping it in-house. And you start to see that it's actually easier to manage, it's lower cost, and it's more secure. So you, you, you over time get over that hurdle. And you don't just, another big point, uh, important point to make is you don't put your financials out there right off the bat. You don't put the most like high, like high security items out there from a documentation perspective. You started with low risk areas. And you started with maybe some like smaller data sets and use cases. And then over time, you started to bring like your test dev data to your tier two or priority two application data to eventually you brought your tier one out there. So I think you're going to see a very similar push with generative AI, where it's not like you're going to put your most mission critical or your most sensitive data there right off the bat. But over time, as it's proven out and the value shown, that's when I believe the trust will come. And I don't think it'll take as long as the journey to the cloud, which is arguably five, six, seven, 10 years for some companies. I think given the rate of change and the pace of change and just like the competitive aspect that it's going to cultivate of if you're not doing it, your competitors are going faster. I think that will probably be in a year or two as opposed to a decade, like the journey of the cloud. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate the fact that you talked about obviously discussing with customers how they might use it, what some use cases might be, what they would look like, but also experimenting with it for help desk. So it's sort of looking at it in two different ways, because if you can't understand it from sort of the 360 points all the way around it, there's going to be some blind spots when the day comes and you're actually looking to implement. So it's very interesting that you're getting the opportunity to sort of test it from the driver's seat, but then also say to other people like, hey, does anybody want to come with us and how would you want to use this? It feels like a lot of those conversations need to happen, not just to suss out the best ideas, but also to calm some of those nerves from people that might be skeptics about what risks this could potentially expose companies to. Yeah. And I think one thing that we have the advantage of is if you're a new startup, then you're creating the tech and you're trying to find people to give you feedback and use it, eventually pay for it. Like you're, you're trying to do all that at once. Now on the other end of the spectrum, uh, if you're a very, very large company, you can't move as fast. I, mean, I know that's like nuance where some companies have great like innovation departments, but for sure. the most part, you can't move as fast. So we're kind of in that sweet spot of being a high growth, mid-sized like company. So what it allows us to do is it allows us to move super fast where we iterate and update our, our beta every other night, sometimes even faster. We do it at the very worst once a week uh, from like customer findings from new ideas. Uh, but we also have like a good customer base of very large enterprises and some very like high growth tech companies that are there that want to go on the journey. So they give us very fast feedback. Um, and they're also like eager because they're already a customer to work with us on this because it's, it's saying, okay, we already have this partnership. How do we keep extending it out? Especially if we're pushing the envelope when it comes to Gen AI. So I, I think on the either end of the spectrum, it's mm -hmm. kind of tough sometimes where I think for companies our stage, it just becomes really interesting where um, you can really look to disrupt. And it's, uh, it's shocking how maybe say another a provider might have spent the last four or five years building out a certain area that with Gen AI, you can kind of accomplish a similar output in two or three months. Yeah, Like it, it makes you think, how do you defend yourself? Because that means someone else can do it to you, but then where, where can you go on the offensive? So from a customer perspective, it's looking at your current providers and saying like, who can start to expand out what they're doing with us? Um, it's, it's a very interesting conversation. No, it certainly is. And it will be interesting, as you'd mentioned, as sort of the acceptance and the development and the use all expands and speeds up. You know we're going to be seeing an awful lot of things from this over the next, I mean, certainly over the next year, but you just know every two months, every quarter, there's going to be a whole new level of perspective and adoption. And so this is something I have a feeling that unlike things like blockchain, we're going to be talking about this not only from the results perspective, but continually for quite a bit of time to come. Now, as we start to wrap down our time, I want to take you through a tradition here at The Sourcing Hero, Kevin. Everybody does this the first time they join me on the show. So I'm going to give you two questions. You can choose to answer either one you want. And as many times as I think I've heard all the answers, I always hear something new. So there's no such thing as a wrong answer either. So here are your choices. The first one is, what does the idea of a sourcing hero mean to you? And the second option is, what does heroism look like 
in a business context? It's up to you. I'll take the first one. <clears throat> um, a sourcing hero is someone that challenges status quo and then executes for the business. Where um, in, our, in our view and in my view, um, the people that we've seen drive the most value for an organization are the ones that um, sometimes are the contrarian, but sometimes has a negative view on that. But it's more of they realize that things can always get better. You can always improve if you shake things up, um, which is like half of it because that's super important. The other part is the more important part than executing for the business because it's one thing to have a great idea to want to shake things up, to want to bring in new tech. But if you can't provide the business value, then you kind of just create a swirl for nothing. So the sourcing hero that when the sourcing heroes that we see, they have the ability to do both, um, and they have the ability to influence the rest of the organization to understand why it's so important and why it drives meaningful value, um, all the way aligned to top line goals and OKRs for the overall business. So it's it's a rare person, a group of people, but when you find them, and, and you can see the best procurement orgs, they usually have like two or three that just let they, they get it. Uh, people describe had one of the people I'm thinking about. Uh, one of their teammates, they described him as like, it's like playing with Michael Jordan back in the day. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and like and that was not coach. That was just someone saying that. It's like watching Michael Jordan play because of just how they were executing. And I thought like, that's pretty cool that someone, it wasn't even, it was someone that was, uh, they were on the process side of procurement and it wasn't in like a senior leadership role, but they had the, they, they had the, the buy-in from the executives all the way down to the tactical buyers and then to the end users. And when you find those people, they're just force multipliers. And it's, it's so fun to work with them and then to see them operate. Especially given all the opportunities that we have to innovate right now, right? To work with somebody like that in these conditions, that truly is an opportunity. It makes it fun. Yeah. I feel like people, um, if things are changing, if people are getting up level, that means that they're up leveling their career, their skill sets, they're up leveling the value to the business. And then people stay longer, typically at a company, if they feel like they're being challenged. Um, and it's just one of those things where it's like a force multiplier and it's compounding, where people are always doing more exciting work, providing more value. Uh, you can then also recruit really good people because then you create this like culture of innovation. Um, so like it, it's, it's truly compounding where companies that are doing it well are just exponentially outpacing companies that aren't. Um, there's like that gap is going to continue growing from like a competitive perspective of like the difference in terms of the execution of the procurement teams. If people have joined us today and want to connect with you or continue the conversation, what is the best way for them to get in touch? LinkedIn is great. Um, and happy to chat with anyone that is thinking about their Gen AI journey, uh, whether you're on it, whether you're not yet, whether you think, hey, I'm, I'm blowing smoke right now and it's a complete bubble. Uh, if you want to try to talk me out of that, like I, I'm, I'm down. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's more just it's like having the conversation. And then um, whether it's in two months, six months, so some people might never adopt it. It's at least great to hear all different perspectives. And if, if I can help out or we can help out in any way with people on their journey, we'd love to. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sourcing Hero Podcast. Join us again next time for more true stories of sourcing and business heroism performed by your colleagues and peers. Look for The Sourcing Hero wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe. Finally, don't forget, sourcing heroism is taking place all around us every day. Keep your eyes open and you're bound to see it. Until next time, I'm your host, Kelly Barner. Stay well and always remember that you can be a hero too.